Thanks very much, Keith, for your kind words. And um, hello, comrades, friends and fellow travellers. Firstly, let me pay my respects to the Wadjuk Nyunar people on whose land we meet tonight, and I honour their elders past and present. I would also like to pay tribute to my partner, Rob, and to my family, particularly my boys who've made it here tonight with their friends. And I'd like to thank my Fafada family, in particular, my comrade committee members um, who've been able to join us, Kevin, Lou, Lexi, Tim, Sian, Simon and Tom. It is a great privilege to be asked to give the Harold Peden Memorial Lecture and I consider myself very lucky to have started my work in the union movement with many great mentors and peers. Harold Peden, together with Revo Gandini, Keith Peckham, Donna White, Neil Byrne and Vic Slater were wonderful influences on my generation of union activists and many of us who are now preparing for retirement ourselves were lucky to witness these great leaders and to be a part of the strong collectives where there were robust discussions, hard decisions and great care was exercised for workers and their families. Harold Peden was a man of integrity and he was a modest man who brooked no nonsense. Initially, when I met Harold, I was a young uni student, I can't believe I was ever young, volunteering in the union movement, and he was a bit scary, which I think said more about me at that time than it did about him, because he was indeed kind. He was broad-minded, and he had the capacity to focus the collective's attention on workers and their welfare, and he lived the principles that he applied within his own union, as well as across the broader movement. One of the very real and important lessons that I learnt from Harold Peden, that I try to apply in my work today with the Firefighters Union, is that whatever progressive social or political movement we may be members of, we must always work together within our unions for the benefit of our union and our members. That is the real practice of unity and progress. I thought that it was a real strength within the Metal Workers Union and other unions of the harder left that power and leadership positions were not restricted to women and men from any one political party. <coughs> that didn't mean that we didn't have our blues or arguments. And what impressed me about Harold Peden and his peers was that they focused on the collective and the best outcomes for all. Without that commitment to unity and the rank and file, it can become too easy to be seduced by politics with a purely parliamentary focus, and it can become too easy to be consumed by interfactional warfare instead of improving the lives of working women and men. You could never accuse Harold Peden of wasting time king and queen making at the parliamentary end of the political road, and neither could you ever suggest that he developed a cult of the personality revolving around himself or his ego. He was practical, he knew how to negotiate, and he taught many of us some good lessons about patience, incremental change, and social justice. Keith Peckham never held back either, and it certainly gave me an amazing insight into how important it is within our unions to have strong, principled leaders capable of arguing the point, win or lose, and then equally capable of going forward with the decisions made by the collective or the union committee. That takes discipline, strength and integrity. So thanks to you too, Keith, for your influence, which is always appreciated, and um, I'm responsible for all of my own mistakes. My mentors definitely are. I also want to thank Stella Files for her support, her friendship, her humour, and her attention to detail for our movement and our history. She stuns me every single time we catch up. And she has a lot to tell us about life growing up in a Communist Party household. Um, at this stage, I still have the piano, Stella, with all of its history, and we're going to need to get together and, um, and write the piano's history because it's seen some good times, even um, uh, with grumpy Laurie Carmichael, I believe, in the day. Right? I want to pay tribute to the late Neil Byrne for his gentle strength and kindness, his passionate and practical outlook for workers and his support for so many of us in this room tonight. 
He epitomised the quiet achiever and he never gave up on the ALP and some of us who are less patient and kind may have from time to time. He was a wonderful man and he deserved every accolade that he's received both in his life and since he's died. Make no mistake, those of our members who pursue careers in the parliament can be of great value for working men and women and their families and our communities. In 2019, we desperately need them to focus on changing laws and returning the industrial relations systems to those we had before and to ensure that ordinary women and men can seek redress and protection from exploitation in the workplace in tribunals that can genuinely conciliate and arbitrate over a broad range of industrial issues and workplace issues. We need a system of industrial relations law that delivers not just minimum outcomes, but real and living wages for workers and consequences for the employers who have lost their way or who have gone rogue. There are still some Labor and other politicians who believe that staying in government is predicated as being seen as not being too close to unions and who do not appear to have the guts to improve our laws to the extent that rogue employers survive without reforming or improving. Those politicians need help to assist them to rebuild and to maintain relationships with our movement for the greater good of all our communities and their greater good. Harold Peden's family members, Don and Jan and Noel, who are with us tonight, shared Harold with the union movement and the peace movement and many other great social justice causes. We are in your debt and I hope you realise how proud he was of his family and how much we value his legacy and his example. The title for my talk tonight was a bit obscure, but I wanted to not only honour Harold Peden and the legacy he left us all, I wanted to talk about my wonderful union, the Professional Firefighters Union, and its achievements, and to hopefully bust a couple of myths along the way. And some of the things I may have to say will be controversial, but that's what our movement's all about, and we've got to have those debates. It's important for our survival. The United Professional Firefighters Union was founded in 1916, and as we say to the recruit firefighters when we first meet them, we stand on the shoulders of the men and women who have gone before us, and the conditions and pay that we have today exist because we've fought for them. Our conditions and pay were not given to firefighters on a plate by the boss. We have just over 1,200 members, and approximately 950 of those are on our stations or in our triple zero communication centre in what we call operational fire defence. We have approximately 45 members who work for Broad Spectrum, genuinely a rogue employer, and they service the Pierce Air Base and Stirling Naval Base defence bases. We are 99.4% organised, so that means we've got about 10 non-members who would be el eligible to join us. We are unashamedly a service-oriented union for our members, and I'm going to return to that a little later when I look at my union and a frightening trend of deunionisation that dominates Australia today. The Fire and Rescue Service is absolutely a male-dominated industry, but our workplaces should not be tarred with the generalisation of being contaminated by some sort of cliched, toxic masculine culture. This is 2019, and whilst not all of our members are perfect, and that's especially me, the culture and ethos of our members is one that is more correctly characterised by fairness, and at times I perceive our rank and file as being frustratingly fair and empathetic. And I often say and discuss with my good friend and comrade Kevin Jolly, our president, there are times that our rank and file could do with a dose of the mongrel to balance their fair and empathetic natures. 5% of our members are women, and that includes two professional officers, in 1987, the Fire Brigade of WA employed the first woman firefighter. And we all know that Australia has the most highly gender segmented workforce in the OECD. The Scandinavian countries have the least gender segmented workforces, and yet the percentage of women professional firefighters there is sitting at over 3%. The Firefighters Union in Western Australia has been groundbreaking. And in 2006, Jane Humphreys became the first woman firefighter 
on a firefighter union committee anywhere in Australia. In 2007, I became the woman, our union's first woman industrial officer in WA. In 2012, Lexi Bowring, who's here with us tonight, she became the first elected woman officer on our committee and she was popularly elected in contested elections because it's quite a popular thing in our union to seek election, so um, not everything is stage managed. That was another first for Australia and we also have Kerry Bailey, who's our first woman communication systems officer from the triple zero centres, um, to be on a firefighter union committee. In that year, I was elected as assistant secretary for our union, which is an honorary position on top of my day job. And in 2015, I became our union secretary. And I'm the fourth professional officer to hold that position since the 1970s. This has not been particularly controversial for my members, but it has caused some shockwaves outside of the union. And surprisingly, it got a bit of a reaction from some women, um, including a few within our broader movement. But in 2018, the members in South Australia elected Max Adlam in a contested ballot as the second woman firefighters union secretary in Australia. And as Keith and I discussed, she too has a pedigree and background in the metal workers union. So it will be interesting to see what will happen in the future. Our broader society is having a great discussion about gender and identification. And while tonight we're not going to unpack that debate, we may see within my lifetime a time where gender is not seen as an issue and where we accept applicants, nominees and position holders without reference or controversy related to gender identification. That doesn't, think, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have our battles for equality because those battles are not over. But those battles are definitely changing. Our women members overwhelmingly do not want quotas imposed for women in the fire service and they do not support the standard of entry for firefighting recruits to be watered down for women applicants. Our strong, capable, outstanding women members are not victims of some sort of Stockholm syndrome, and it is beyond the consideration of being patronising to ignore their voices in the discussion about how to address the low numbers of women applicants. In 2019, tertiary-educated feminists, male and female, would not dream of dictating the strategies and solutions to inequality for Aboriginal and culturally and linguistically diverse women. So why would it be considered acceptable to impose outdated arguments and strategies on blue collar women firefighters? Some of the strategies suggested by the boss over the last few years to address the low number of women firefighters come out of the 1980s Femocrat playlist and they don't work for firefighters and they don't work for our industry. Quotas might well suit executives. They definitely are needed in some political parties and they should be considered for the cabinet because there are no real concrete fixed standards for entry and talent identification in those sorts of jobs and glass ceilings really do exist. But firefighting requires a unique combination of mechanical reasoning, strength, fitness and practical intelligence and women make great firefighters and officers and women have duxed our recruit schools and they have won the Practical Achievement Awards. Not as many women apply to become firefighters and of the few that do, it appears from some recent analysis that a slightly higher percentage of women applicants get into recruit school and they tend to train hard and prepare solidly for selection. So myth number one the great untold story of recruitment includes the stories of the thousands of blokes who don't get into recruit school to become professional firefighters. The recruitment process for firefighters is very competitive and slowly the department is returning recruitment to place it under more genuine operational control. With great joy last night, I read that one of our outstanding senior firefighters, Nikki Harwood, is coming off the trucks to work on a 12 month recruitment project with women of the calibre of Lexi Bowring from our committee, who's just been the acting district officer in charge of her sixth recruit school. And that's something that's not well known in the broader community. And she is respected because she sets a standard to maintain a standard. Nikki is also a level three accredited AFL coach, which is an outstanding achievement 
for somebody of her age, let alone for, um, of, of, of her gender. She has an amazing record of coaching and mentoring in her sport. Nikki will build on some great work that Lexi and others have done in recruitment more recently, and together with other operational personnel, we hope to see a more operationally focused, targeted recruitment campaign for the very best firefighters we can get for our community. Nikki, for her crimes against humanity, has successfully coached East Fremantle in the WAFLW and is now on the staff of the Eagles in the AFLW. And she has previously been an assistant coach with the Western Bulldogs and with Collingwood. We've had other wonderful members who've coached and played with the AFLW Dockers and in the WAFL. But I can't see Nikki ever going over to the mighty South Fremantle Club anytime soon. The challenge for our society is a greater one that includes the influences and decision making that occurs with potential firefighters, nurses and teachers. And I am talking about the choices that children as young as five years of age start to make in Australia. Because not only do we not have enough women choosing to become firefighters, we have very few men who choose to become teachers and nurses. The strategies to address this will take time and effort within our broader community. <coughs> inequitable quotas, inequitable suggestions of hex fee relief for teachers and nurses, and other so-called incentives and the quick and dirty statistic changes are not the answer. And we need to shift the minds and hearts of the decision makers away from the solutions that we applied in the 1980s. This is a broader community issue. Our movement continues to fight for equal pay and equal opportunity and we need to adapt to the circumstances we faced in each of the battles that we fight as a progressive <coughs> movement. We cannot rely on the same game plan for every battle that we take on. Within the industry of firefighting, casualisation is a very real threat to firefighter safety and to our conditions of employment. Interestingly, arguments around flexibility from the boss that relate to our conditions of employment have surfaced. And some of the so-called non-firefighting experts have tried to tell the union that it was women who wanted to change our shift roster for family reasons. Let me tell you, our young parents, men and women, they love our 10-14 shift roster. That is, two 10-hour days, two 14-hour nights with 14, four days off in between. And that's myth number two. Flexible rosters and family responsibilities. What other full-time job do you know of that gives you six out of every eight days at home with your kids? And many of our male members are the full-time carers of children and unlike the male executives at Clough Engineering that we read about in the West Australian this week, who were reported not to be accessing their paid parental leave, we have a lot of new parents who access paid parental leave, and the number of our dads accessing those 14 weeks is really very high relative to other industries. Having stared down the women want more flexible rosters arguments, which was a false construct, the next bright idea from the bureaucrats was to casualise our jobs and the next round of attacks under the guise of equal opportunity were attributed to the desire from some of our retiring members to transition to retirement through part-time work. And our members can work part-time, but not on the trucks. They go across to the 320 over 8 roster and most of our members are not interested in working part-time before retirement because we still have a defined benefit superannuation fund. That means that the industry super fund that the Firefighters Union and the Fire Brigades Board established in 1938 still has a defined benefit scheme and people don't want to reduce their potential final payout by going part-time. Our union in 1938 began these discussions and our members over the journey have given up pay increases to increase their superannuation benefits long before the ACTU, Paul Keating and Bob Hawke were, discuss were discussing industry superannuation. Casualisation is a very real threat and some conservatives believe that volunteers can fill the gaps. Myth number three. Professional firefighters don't work well with volunteers. What a load of nonsense. Most of our members have been volunteers and many return to volunteering in their retirement. 
Our membership is not anti-volunteer and that polemical characterisation of professional firefighters is driven by those who thrive on division and conflict. The research, particularly the Productivity Commission reports on the efficiency of our fire services around Australia, show that volunteer firefighter numbers are declining, which reflects the population statistics in many rural and regional communities, and that the average age of volunteer firefighters is close to 50 and it's increasing. It should be noted that most volunteers sign up to protect their local communities, not to take other people's jobs. I want to walk you through several of the achievements that our small union has achieved in the last 103 years. The 10-14 shift roster, two 10-hour days, two 14-hour nights, was introduced in 1970. And the introduction of the 10-14 shift roster was flowed onto the WA Ambulance Union by the great legend of our union, Jack Dennis. We have an award within our union that sits alongside our life membership honour named after Jack Dennis, and we consider that honour to be the equivalent of our Brownlow for service to our union and to firefighters. Jack Dennis and the committees of his era led the campaigns to amalgamate the firefighter and officer unions, and Bill Latter, a non-firefighter and another contemporary of Harold Pedens and Keats, and Revo Gandini, Bill was employed as the secretary of the newly amalgamated union in 1970. In the era of efficient but very dangerous fire extinguishers, which used carbon tetrachloride in the foam and where firefighters refilled those extinguishers, Jack Dennis began to observe that many firefighters were getting sick and some were developing kidney cancer. And so began another campaign for firefighter health and safety. Scientific analysis confirmed Jack's observations and his concerns through the union backed up by the science led to the worldwide phasing out of the carbon tetrachloride materials in extinguisher foam. In the tradition of the work that Jack Dennis and his peers delivered, and with the deep concerns that we have for firefighter health, safety and wellbeing, and despite the fact that our members work in a high-risk industry, often in confined, superheated and dangerous environments, our union achieved significant reform to the West Australian Workers' Compensation Law in 2013 with a Conservative state government. The changes to the law in WA were based on the work of our International Association of Firefighter Comrades, the Americans and Canadians, of course, that's international in the broadest sense. And in particular, that work was based on the Canadian legislative model. This work created a legal presumption that 12 occupational firefighter cancers are caused by exposures to the toxins firefighters encounter through their work over time, with the latency periods measured in years based on science and statistics. In 2016, we successfully saw the extension of those workers' compensation protections for our retired professional firefighters for the entire duration of their retirement. So most workers' comp cuts out very quickly after you retire. Our retired members who have a diagnosis after November 2013 are entitled, of, of a primary cancer, are entitled to full coverage under the system. And that will cover the costs of any additional health treatments that they may have. I'm delighted to see one of our industrial officers nodding at me because the union continues to work on behalf of our serving and retired members with their workers' compensation claims for these occupational cancers. The union's campaign was based on the last truly successful national firefighters campaign. We had Western Australian officials and rank and file members who lobbied the Gillard government as a part of a genuinely national delegation from all around the country. Adam Bant, the Greens member for Melbourne, drafted the legislative change for the Commonwealth law the Senate committee inquiry included some hard-nosed, I'd like to say something else, but I'm trying to be very good tonight, hard-nosed conservatives, including Erica Betts, who of course is no fan of our movement and the broad engagement of our rank and file, coupled with international scientific evidence, achieved these reforms. And it was on the back of that we came to WA and did the hard work here. We used that scientific evidence and the voice of our members who had lived with cancer and who had survived the treatments 
And we also had the statements from some of our widows and their children. And those statements were very convincing and helped us to successfully lobby the conservative WA Barnett government. Taking those statements probably ranks as some of the hardest work I've ever had to do within our movement. And we owe so much to those women and family members who spoke so bravely about their experiences, knowing that the changes to the Workers' Compensation Act were not going to bring their husbands and fathers back and would not grant them any financial benefit. The untold backstory of that campaign includes the delicate exercise of negotiating with the Labor Party and Greens in the West Australian Parliament. We had to convince some people that the solution required broad political access across the spectrum of the parties. We, were, we couldn't wait for an election promise. And as a union, we were lucky enough to have an ex-senior firefighter, a young bloke, Martin Aldridge, who's sitting in the upper house for the National Party. He understood the sides, he understood the experience, he'd been to the funerals, and he helped us to open doors on the conservative side of the house to lobby and convince politicians that the changes were for the benefit of the men and women who put their lives on the line to protect our communities and citizens across WA. We still refer to the lobbying process at Parliament as, as one of the most difficult and time-consuming parts of our work especially trying to get politicians across all the parties on the page. We often say that being committed unionists and lobbying progressive politicians is a lot like being a Dockers supporter, because it's not the disappointment that kills you, it's the hope. And I say that to you as a Dockers supporter. Because we not only hope to get action from progressive politicians, we expect results and we are sometimes frustrated by the lack of action. Unfortunately, we're still burying our members, and these are members who are younger than me, and I'm, I'm turning, well, I have turned 57 this year. Um, and, uh, and the statements that we, we took from widows were women who were in their early 40s. We, are, we now need to convince the politicians and bureaucrats that they have to put some resources and invest in the latest technologies and equipment and personal protective clothing to lift our preventative approach to these insidious occupational illnesses. It will probably cost three quarters of a million dollars to supply two flash hoods to every professional firefighter in the state with the nanotechnologies that will stop the toxins going in. And the neck is one of the greatest observers for those toxins that are causing these cancers groin and the feet are the next two areas. Evidence is building, unfortunately, across the international firefighter community that the range of cancers firefighters develop is growing. And thyroid cancers are beginning to show up statistically, as well as the full range of female cancers and melanoma. Firefighters start their careers with levels of health and fitness way beyond the average community and yet they are developing these occupational cancers at ages much younger than the average community and at higher rates than the general population. Together with the police union and the MISOs, because I'm going to use that old-fashioned word, I can't keep up with what we're calling them now, um, who, and the MISOs represent ambulance paramedics in WA, we are also lobbying the state government to address the alarming rate of post-traumatic stress injuries experienced by firefighters, police and ambos. At the same time that we need to convince the politicians that it is not only more humane to act on, on post-traumatic stress injuries, but it would also inevitably be cheaper to treat personnel with those injuries instead of automatically investigating all stress claims before considering treatment. That puts in, on average, a 12 to 13 week delay. We need to convince the politicians to resource and support preventative measures to help build resilience and to ensure that our members can continue to be operational and live with well-managed mental and physical health. To that effect, my union has initiated a network of union peer health and wellbeing representatives. Within our membership, we have a number of firefighters with sports science and fitness and coaching backgrounds. And we want these rank and file firefighter reps to lead the way with education and information about health and wellbeing for the rest of our membership. Our goal is in to engage all of our members, especially those who need to improve their health, mental and physical fitness and weight. He says. 
It's not about replicating standards based on elite athletes, it's about capturing the people who need the help the most. And again, we are indebted to our International Association of Firefighter Colleagues, and we have identified the Fire Brigade of Edmonton in the province of Alberta in Canada as being one of the world's best firefighting industry leaders when it comes to health and wellbeing. Our union supports what we now call the Edmonton model, and we have sent union representatives to Edmonton to further investigate how they do what they do so well. And I acknowledge again Kevin Jolly, our President, and Lou Parker, our Assistant Secretary, who are here tonight. Um, I acknowledge the work that they have done with the Edmonton model. And the keys to the success of the program in Edmonton is that it's not compulsory and they offer a comprehensive medical check each year for the firefighters and officers in that brigade. The results remain confidential between the firefighter and the doctor. And if the firefighter doesn't have a GP or a specialist, the employer um, provides access to the brigade doctor. And again, the employer only receives confidential aggregated data. This approach to firefighter wellbeing means that occupational illnesses and injuries are often diagnosed in the early stages, which results in great clinical outcomes. Chief Officer Ken Block from Edmonton gave evidence to the Australian Senate inquiry for the presumptive cancers. And he was able to confirm that the cost of workers' compensation for his workforce, which is about the same size as our brigade in WA, remains at 1.5% of the total wages bill in a very dangerous, high-risk industry. His evidence was also proof that a compassionate approach to health, safety and wellbeing can deliver good financial outcomes. And that financial data was what got the hard-nosed Conservatives on the Senate committee across the line. Needless to say, we brought Chief Ken Block, together with the IAWF Canadian trustee, Alex Forrest, to WA to help convince politicians and bureaucrats to legislate to protect firefighters. We remain indebted to our international colleagues, especially the IAWF and Alex Forrest and Chief Ken Block. Returning back to the network, the union network of peer fitness and wellbeing reps, we've used the same framework that we use for our delegate structure, and we are aiming to have at least one rep on each station or workplace, and we have begun to invest in their training. Firefighters are very competitive and we've had multiple applications from some stations and we're having to settle it down until we get our head around the network. But it's a good thing. We brought Police Sergeant Mick Sturley from New South Wales to Perth to meet with our senior officers and executives in the department and to provide a training day for our fitness reps and committee members. Mick is a serving police officer who is also a sports scientist and he's worked with NRL teams. He became frustrated with what we'll call the perpetual cycle of workers' comp referrals and the high number of New South Wales police personnel who were not recovering from their physical and mental injuries. He initiated a framework of peer-supported sports science and fitness coach-led factories, I'll call them, where police could be treated holistically and his program began to see a turnaround in the results. It may have helped that some senior very senior police officers benefited from this new approach. But more importantly, when there was some opposition from within what we'll call the workers' comp industry, dominated by the never-ending cycle of ongoing referrals, he challenged them to give him their top 20 worst cases from the New South Wales Police Department. And his program saw all of those officers return to duty within an average of 12 to 13 weeks. The program is changing the face of workers' comp injury management within the New South Wales Police Department. Again, it is a humane approach to injury management that engages the police, treats their physical and mental injuries holistically, and it's convincing the bureaucrats and bean counters because it's cost effective. So the reason for my long explanation about firefighter health and wellbeing is that we need to see some change in the treatment of firefighters' workers' compensation and non-workers' compensation injury management. My union doesn't shrink back and step away from advocacy and support for our most vulnerable members, and we want the government to support the return to work and care for the people who are often broken by the service they provide for our citizens and communities across WA. 
Neither will my union accept that our advocacy is some form of bullying. And despite those accusations being levelled at us, not once were we included or interviewed in any safety investigation about such claims. It is clear that there are some within the workers' comp industry who need to improve their knowledge of the law, they need to shift their focus from the corporate-driven insurers, and they need to concentrate on the needs of our most vulnerable workers. And this government has begun to address some of these issues, and we now are calling for more reform. What is perhaps not well known outside of our industry is that before the WA Fire Brigade became FISA in the late 1990s, we had approximately 850 firefighters and officers in operational fire defence, mainly on our fire stations and in the communication centre. We had approximately 40 administrative staff. After 10 years of FISA, and as our Department of Fire and Emergency Services evolved, in 2010, 20 years on, we have approximately 950 firefighters and officers in operational fire defence and over 400 administrators. This is disproportionate to most of the other brigades in Australia and previous executives, hangers on perhaps from the previous governments, have justified these figures on the basis of the number of volunteers that need support. But if the majority of volunteers belong to approximately 120 separate local government agencies, there's some serious over-administration going on. We're the only state where the bushfire brigades belong to local government and it's ridiculous, but it's going to take us a, a while to get that sorted out. The citizens of WA pay their emergency services levy for specific service delivery and protection. There is complex formulas that redistribute some of the metropolitan ESL collected to regional WA. But we haven't seen genuine growth of the fire service in over 20 years on the front line. We should have more resources, more operational personnel and better equipment to service the vast state of WA. In New South Wales and Victoria, the Productivity Commission report shows that the average response times are much better than in WA. In the cities of Sydney and Melbourne, fire stations are built closer to each other than they are in metropolitan Perth. Not only that, they don't shut down the fire stations in those cities and relocate them, they build new ones. So firefighters are on the scene more quickly with good backup. In Perth and WA, in the last 20 years, we've seen incredible suburban and urban development. And yet we've only had one new additional fire station, and that's the Vincent Fire Station in West Leaderville, which re-established some of the capacity loss when our number one station down the road in Hay Street, which is now a glamorous hotel, I believe, um, was shut down and we lost ten and a half bays and they built a lemon on Wellington Street um, that barely can fit three trucks. We now have to rebuild, oh, we, sorry, we now have rebuilt professional fire stations in the country cities of Geraldton, Albany and Bunbury. Kalgoorlie used to have the best fire station, they're now at the bottom of, of that pile. But that's it for regional WA. And you know how vast our state is, you know where our populations are, you understand the risk in the Pilbara, and the last professional fire station is Geraldton. We have a network of enhanced regional offices where our officers support volunteers. But when you consider the risk in areas like Esperance, Vass, Caratha and Broome, and the resources required to deal with the risks of fires, hazardous material incidents, road and rail transport and marine firefighting, then WA is spectacularly underdone. And it's our union's job to campaign for our industry and our members who care about the protection of their fire districts. It's not good enough to gamble with the protection of our communities and infrastructure across this state and to rely so heavily on an ageing and declining population of volunteers. That brings me to climate change. Our President, Kevin Jolly, often says that there are no sceptics on the end of a fire hose. Firefighters and farmers and conservationists all agree that the cycle of drought and rising temperatures and the measured dryness of our soil are all factors that contribute to longer and more catastrophic fire seasons. Our union supports mitigation and controlled burns but we all have much to learn from Indigenous land managers and those who've worked on the land for many years. 
Controlled burns have to be safely managed so that they do not become catastrophic fires. And they need to ensure that there are wildlife corridors for our flora as well as for our fauna. The catastrophic fires in the last 10 years in our state have not led to increased professional firefighting resources. The various reports and inquiries into those fires instead have banged on about relationships on the fire ground and they have not addressed the crucial fundamental issues. They have not delivered any new stations or more personnel and this is a disgrace and it's a disgrace that has to be shared across the political spectrum. It's not a new problem and as we speak, members of my union have been recalled from their annual leave to deploy to the catastrophic fires in the eastern states to relieve those firefighters who are exhausted from the struggles that they've faced in the last few weeks. We couldn't send off-duty personnel because we don't have enough firefighters on the ground in WA to service our own escalating needs. They need to be available for their four rosters. My union is concerned that the hype and response around the Ferguson report is not delivering resources on the ground where they're needed. We need a state-of-the-art training facility built in a centrally located accessible area on uncontaminated land to support our frontline personnel. And the community members who pay their emergency services to le levy deserve better bang for their buck. The last industry issue I'd like to raise relates to the failure of local, state and federal governments to effectively regulate and police imported building materials and construction. You would all be very familiar with the Grenfell Tower disaster, fuelled by cladding and other shoddy building, imported building materials like Galaxy Wiring. We thank the CFMEU, the ETU and the Metalworkers Union for working with us to ensure that we fight for the re-regulation of the importation of products and the genuine policing of buildings and water supplies. We need our Labor politicians to stand up and support jobs, local content and safety. The five minute wonder of headlines about cutting red tape, they don't deliver safe outcomes for the community, for workers and particularly for firefighters. So watch out for the Grenfell Inquiry reports and examine them very carefully. The firefighters and the London Fire Brigade have been hung out to dry. The, statement made, the statements made by our comrades from the FBEU are harrowing. Many of them did not expect to survive that incident and they are haunted by the death trap of a building that was refurbished without proper fire safety regulation. Boris Johnson was a previous Mayor of London and Theresa May was the previous Home Secretary in the United Kingdom who cut funding to the fire service. The terms of reference for that inquiry did not include reviewing the lack of regulation for the building refurbishment, did not include a review of fire safety standards and fire brigade resources. So we stand in support of the FBEU in the UK and with the families of the victims of that fire. From the margins to the mainstream. Bit of a discussion that I think we all had as feminists in the late 80s. What can the movement learn from our history and the experiences of a small and successful union? My union has practiced the principle of bringing all of our members from the margins to the mainstream. Our diverse membership is united because they want to be the best firefighters possible. We have supported our members to be active in all areas of our union and in OSH and welfare support. Within our small union, we do nearly as much welfare work for our members as industrial work. And like some other unions, we engage in broader debates, but on our terms. That can be a bit of a challenge and some of our environmental comrades, friends, groups, want to tell firefighters and the firefighters union what to say. But we remain in charge of our destiny and our messages. Early on in my career, <coughs> Revo Gandini and Vic Slater encouraged a number of younger activists at the time, and I'm saying again, I once was young. We were encouraged to go to a Red Meets Green forum to support Claire Howell, who was then a Vice President of the Trades and Labor Council, when she spoke at that forum. And nearly 30 years later, I still feel some of the fr same frustrations that I felt that night. 
Lately, my union has been bombarded by numerous climate change activists with requests for firefighters to speak, or for them to speak on our behalf, and for us to be photographed at rallies. And they try and tell us what to say, and they can't get their head around the fact that we can speak for ourselves, and that rank and file firefighters can't speak to the media without the permission of the commissioner because of the regulations of the Fire Brigades Act, oh, sorry, because of the Fire Brigades Act of 1942 and the regulations of 1943. These issues are much bigger than a stereotyped headline or jumping on the back of the work that firefighters do. We do speak at climate change rallies and some of our best speeches have been made by our president, Kevin Jolly. The Professional Firefighters Union actively service our members and the broader union movement began to move away from a servicing model to the organising model in the 1990s. The statistics now reveal a terrible picture. Union membership numbers are at an all-time low. Unions have become marginalised and we are not in the mainstream of our Australian communities anymore. We need to review our strategies collectively and we need to reflect on our history. We have always needed to organise and we always will, but we now need to change our thinking and to embrace a broader approach of service for the benefit of our members and for our ultimate survival. We need to reflect on what we have achieved and how things have improved. And thanks to leaders like Harold Peden and many of his peers, as a movement we are now more inclusive of women than when I started in the mid 80s. We better support all workers with family responsibilities, including ageing parents. We live in a society where love is love and not a crime, where women can safely make decisions about their health and having children. We need to continue to ensure that the arts are a part of all of our working lives and that we celebrate and have fun at least some of the time. Arts officer, a multicultural affairs officer, a health and safety officer, an industrial and workers comp officer and a superannuation officer. We mostly were restricted to the downstairs floor um, away from our elected leaders and we sometimes used to use a Vegemite glass in Fred Brown's office to listen to the <laughs> arguments in the boardroom, particularly when the union secretaries around the state would get together to discuss our conditions. How things have changed. They were heady days for young activists. We had funding from Commonwealth governments to support that union work. And now the model for interns within our movement disperses the talent directly to the affiliates. And that may continue to be a great strategy. We need to stand up and be part of the solution that rids our broader community of the scourge of domestic and family violence and the hatred that underpins all forms of racism and homophobia. And perhaps we need to be a little less of the mongrel at times and, a, and exercise a little more kindness and empathy. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak tonight and to reflect on my union um, and on the work of our movement's leaders, including Harold Peden. As I heard Harold say many times, we are the custodians of our unions for the next generation of workers and none of us are indispensable. We need to reflect on our history, we need to learn from our experiences and we need to nurture those who will take us forward into a better future. No pressure, young people. Thank you.